Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Allison. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank whoever asked me to speak. I don't know if it was Brian or Larry, but thank you. Um, Congratulations to the birthday people, and thank you for your 10 minutes. Our stories are very similar, so I feel like we should just go home. (laughs) I, um, I, you know, I'll just get into it. Like, I, uh... I was born, I was adopted into a, what I perceive to be a very normal family. Um, I've gotten a little bit more clarity on that over the years, but they're like surprisingly well adjusted and, and just lovely. They're just lovely people and I don't identify with that at all. <laughs> so I, um, I, I grew up always feeling different and apart from and never okay in my own skin. I felt like everybody else seemed to have like gotten a manual or a rule book for life that I just was not equipped with. And I always thought it was because I was adopted that I never felt okay. And, um, you know, I just, I was an uncomfortable kid. Like I was, I never could just be with my peers. I got restless, irritable, and discontent, you know, far before I took a drink. Uh, so I have the memory of um, that I like to share, which kind of talks about the ism part of alcoholism that I experienced, that internal spiritual malady, um, you know, and it's um, in kindergarten. I uh, Our class did this thing where the teacher would go around, it would be your day right? And she'd go around to all the students and have them say something nice about you. And she'd record it on a pretty piece of paper and send you home with it at the end of the day with like all these like lovely things that your classmates thought about you. And so when my day came around, I tried to throw myself down the stairs because I just, I didn't want to go because I knew that they couldn't possibly have anything kind to say about me. And I don't know what that says to you, but what that says to me is I needed a goddamn drink. And I did not get that drink for quite a while. So I stayed incredibly uncomfortable comfortable and I like walked around the schoolyard like alone singing Phantom of the Opera to myself you know like it was just like things were not okay I was not okay on the inside and um I like to also just circle back now and tell you I shared that with my mother who to this day does not understand me at all she's just like but you were such a nice kid you know and (laughs) does not get alcoholism and she um went (gasps) And she ran, like, into, like, the secret mom stash and brought it out. And so I now have that piece of paper, which is pretty sweet. But anywho, I I was just in pain all of the time. I was in pain all of the time. And my parents were very overbearing. (laughs) And uh, I never had an opportunity to kind of raise hell until the stars aligned and like everything came together one magical weekend when my mother went to Vegas with her mother and the girls. And my sister was still in school. She was in high school at the time. And my father was working. And so he went to work and my mother gave me $200 to, for the week she was going to be gone to allegedly like take care of myself. Cause we knew that my father wasn't going to help there. Right. And, um, I was on spring break. And so I was just basically left alone for the first time ever. And I had been like ready to go for this moment. Like, you know, the spring was tight and I was like going to fly. And so I walked down to my old, I had been moved into a private school by this point. And I walked down to my old middle school, which was in session. And ran into all the kids and it was like, oh, hello, you know, it's like, I haven't seen you in forever. It's been like three months. And, um, and everyone's like, we should celebrate. What should we do? And somebody said, well, we should drink. And I was like, yeah, we should totally drink. I have all this money. Like, let's get it on. And so they, um, they, they like waited till school was over because that's what I guess 13 year olds do. And, and uh, then we walked to the local liquor store, and they shoulder tapped, and they bought me a 40 of Mickey's and a 40 of Old English 800. Yeah. God is good, and I am not. <laughs> and um, I was 
told, by the way, that when you hear something, you know, around here, um, you give credit twice and then it's yours. So that's the rule for parroting uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> um, so I drank those both. And um, the magic happened. Can you just feel it? Like, can you remember right now? <laughs> so good. <laughs> and, um, you know, for the first time, I, f- I, like, dropped into my body. And I was okay. And I didn't care. I wasn't thinking about what you were thinking about me. I wasn't thinking about how I wasn't fit to breathe the air around myself. Um, I just was like, okay. And, you know, this is like, there's like a lot of young people here. You're not even going to know what I'm talking about. But do you guys remember the movie Stand By Me? Okay. I felt like I was with my crew, you know, and I was like walking the tracks and I was with my crew and it was like, everything was okay. And that was the first time I ever remember feeling like that. And I stayed drunk for, I don't even know, like it's blurry now, the period of time. And it was absolutely magical. Like I was with my crew. We were like jumping off of balconies into swimming pools. We found this abandoned like limo in somebody's backyard. I became a woman. And, <laughs> and like, I just had the best time, you know? <laughs> it was so great. And then what happened, hi. <laughs> what happened was um, by the end of that weekend, I like went back to my real life, right? Like mom returned. And I had told my sister everything I had done. I was so proud of myself. Like, I just need you to know I've grown up. And, you know, I had shared everything with her, not knowing that she was in deep trouble with my parents, and she told them everything. Threw me under the bus. Now, I look at 13-year-olds now, and they look like babies to me. So I promise you, it was the first time I saw that real Al-Anon look, where it was, like, incredible horror, you know? Uh, mixed up with unconditional love and fear. And, um, and I remember, you know, my mother just like, she, she never has known how to handle me. And this did not help this situation. And I was in just a ton of trouble with my parents. And then all of a sudden the phone was ringing and it was these girls that I had partied with <laughs> calling me and telling me what a total slut I was and to stay away from their boyfriends and they didn't ever want to see me again and like all of this stuff. And, and, and I tell you that to tell you, I never drank without consequences. Not once. You know, they talk about like, you see other people drink with impunity. <laughs> I'm so jealous. I, cause I loved it. I love drinking, but I paid for every drink I ever took. <sighs> so my parents <laughs> decided to institute a geographic for me. Like, the, all right, we got to get Allison out of L.A. And my father retired. They're older. Um, he retired. And so we decided, you know, we were going to move to New Jersey. And um, is it? Um, and that uh, we were just going to get a fresh start. Their family was there. So I was going to be around family and, like, out of L.A., like, this is going to be a fresh start. And I want you to know what happened for me on the inside was I was really relieved because I felt like I couldn't keep up the hustle where I was. And I sat in my room at night, and I reinvented myself. And I reimagined the person that I wanted to be, and nobody was going to know, you know, my history. And um, what a... You know, so I would just dream up this girl that, like, I, by that time I had, I had stopped swimming. I was a competitive swimmer for a long time. I was very good, and I decided I wanted to quit so that I can, you know, smoke cigarettes and kiss boys. And um, we moved to New Jersey. I'm back. <laughs> we moved to New Jersey. And the first time, I I remember just, like, sitting in my room, and my mom's like, why don't you go to the beach and make some friends? And I'm just like, what do you, how do you think this looks like? I just walk up to somebody and, like, hey, will you be my friend? I hate you. You don't understand me. You don't know what's going on on the inside of me. So the most mortifying thing happened. She set up a play date for me. And I, I met this girl who, to this day, I promise you, she's been on multiple four steps, and I still hate her. She, her name is Cindy in case she's here and (laughs) and she was just perfect she was like the prettiest thing I've ever seen and she was a cheerleader and she had a boyfriend and she got good grades and I could just die you know and so we set up this play date and I'm in the room with her and it's like oh I'm like okay I'm this I'm this new person I'm a new person right and you know I'm trying to like 
be normal, <laughs> like have a conversation with the girl when I just am like, I am not okay on the inside. <laughs> and, um, and I had this outer body experience where, um, I, all of it went out of the window so fast. And I heard myself saying, so what do you guys do here? Do you like drink? Do you smoke? Do you have sex? What do you do? And it was, she was like, no. <laughs> and I was off and running. And what I, that means to me, because I found this in the book, and it talks about it, that we have moral and philosophical convictions galore. And we cannot live up to them even when we want to. I desperately wanted to be like a good girl. You know, I wanted to be normal. I wanted to be able to, like, have a boy ask me out on a date. You know, I wanted to get good grades and be athletic and all this stuff. And I just couldn't. Like, of my own resources, I'll go to one class and I'll never go back. You know, like, that is, like, the best I can do. <sighs> so I started hitting psych wards. <laughs> I love psych wards. They're, like, camp for the crazy kids. They're the absolute best. You know what it is? It's a really concrete third step where you get like plucked out of your life and you turn your will and your life over to the care of the facility and you get to talk about like when you're the, when you're young and in a psych ward, you get to talk about the problem, which is your mother. And you know, you get to like just really just like soak up being out of the system that thinks you should behave in a certain way because I promise you I cannot. I do not have the resources to pretend like I'm okay through an eight-hour school day. I just can't. And so I, I love this, and I go out of, like, this world, and then I get, you know, at some point they send you back. Like, they don't, you can't just stay there. Like, I wasn't, you know, substantial enough to actually stay there. Uh, and I would get, you know, sent back to high school and try to pretend like I was okay, and I just wasn't. And, you know, if you were to go back and talk to my classmates, I was they would probably report I was well-liked. They would probably say that I'm a little bit aloof. I could never stay in one place, you know. I had to, like, go from group to group and just keep moving because I cannot stand that restless, irritable, and discontent, like, to stay in one place. I can't look at myself in the mirror, let alone you looking at me. Like, I have to go. And, uh, you know, I it wasn't like I had that first drink and that I just drank every day. That wasn't my story. I didn't have... I didn't, I don't think I actually knew that was a possibility, number one. And like I said, I was in such a strict family. But I promise you, I drank every chance I could get. And it's only really through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that I've put together my story. Because um, it took me a year sober to realize that the first time I drank, I blacked out. Alcoholics Anonymous taught me what blackouts were. It never occurred to me that it was a problem that I lost time. It just seemed like a benefit. And so I I started doing this, you know, like drinking thing. And I remember a, a party that I was at in high school. And I was so physically drunk, I could barely stand. And I'm in the bathroom performing, you know, some ungodly act on, or very godly as the case may be, in, you know, with a boy that I would have preferred ask me out, like on a date. But that's not how I operate. You know, I end up in the bathroom with him. And I'm so drunk, I can barely stand. And my head is telling me exactly what it's thinking about me. You know, like it's just letting the, the dialogue go. And what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, because I didn't understand this at the time, is my drinking had already stopped working. And I was in a really dire space. Um, I s started being pretty suicidal by 11. And it's not like a great suicidal. It's just the, like, wimpy, I wish I had never been born at all suicidal. I wish, like, I, I was jealous of people that could actually try to commit suicide if that talks about my mental health. And, you know, I, um, I have a friend in Alcoholics Anonymous who talks about the, a similar thought pattern. He's like, yeah, it was the, like, go to sleep, tie a noose around your neck and hope it would snag on something kind of suicidal. That's me. And so I did the psych ward thing, and then I would go back, and I'd drink, and I'd try to be okay, and I just was never okay. But I knew that my mother was the problem. And so I got the opportunity to go to college, and I wanted to come to San Diego. Um, I had gone to a swim camp at USD when I was young, and 
based on nothing else other than I remember the campus being very pretty, I decided that that's where I wanted to go. And, and we came out here and we did the campus tour and like a plan started formulating. You know, it was like, oh, I'm going to get away from my mother. I should go to this school because it's Catholic and they're going to think I'm good, but it has a gay and lesbian club. And I thought at the time I was a lesbian, but it turns out I'm just a slut. And, <laughs> and <I'm, laughs> I'm going to join this club and I'm going to get away from my mother and I'm going to be with women and I'm going to be okay. And that was like, that was the plan. And I set it in motion. So I came out here to USD and the, uh, the exact same thing happened. I moved the day after graduation and I sat in my room again, not recognizing the pattern, I assure you. And I reimagined who I was. I reimagined my life and I decided I wanted to go to college and I wanted to be okay. And I wanted to like get good grades and be an athlete and do all this stuff. And I got to college and literally first night off and running, same behavior, could not do anything different. And I remember at one point I was suicidal, you know, I was drinking as much as I could. It wasn't working. And I was on the phone with my cousin complaining about my mother and how she was the problem. And she was like, Hey, Al, look around. Your mom's nowhere to be found. Like you've, you've been at school now for four months. Nobody's checking up on you. Maybe the problem's you, (sighs) you know? And I, I, God, and it was true. And it was like, I didn't like have an amazing revelation that day. But you know when those little, like, truth starts hit you and it just, like, resonated in there and it was like, oh, crap. Now, I should back up and tell you, I have always been brutally honest with, like, psychiatrists, psychologists, like, doctors in general. I want to just, like, bare my soul to you and I want you to tell me what's wrong with me because my because I don't know, but I certainly know that I'm not okay. And so I had had a psychiatrist and a psychologist at this point. I had a somewhat legitimate suicide attempt, and I had formed those relationships. And and so that was in play. Um, one more drinking story. Um, my girlfriend from high school, my best friend, is one of those like really normal people that just functions without seemingly needing help in the world. I don't get it. And she had come and saved up money and bought herself a plane ticket to come visit me in San Diego. And so we weren't 21, so we headed down to Tijuana. And and I left her there, you know. <laughs> And that's really it about the story. But um, I was a bridesmaid in her wedding, and she was a bridesmaid in mine. So yay, yay, yay. healing. Um, she's okay, by the way. So was I. <laughs> so I started dating this boy, and um, and by this time, oh, you know, I had a best friend freshman year of college, and he was really my drink in some ways. Um, like he stepped in into my life and we just became like, you know, barnacles on each other, just besties. And he lost his scholarship and had to go. And when he lost his scholarship, I was devastated. I had nothing and I had no plan. And that's when I became a raver. And it saved my life because it introduced me to non-approved AA substances, which kept me alive for the next nine months and awake for that matter. Um... (laughs) And I was very tired. <laughs> I was very tired. And so I started dating this boy, and he was getting in the way because he's like, what are you doing? Like, this is, like, not normal. And and he just, like, loved me and adored me, and I just needed you to go over there so I could get it on. And so I broke up with him, but because I'm not honest or courageous or have the ability to, like, you know, speak to my own feelings in any way, shape, or form, I told him we were just on a break so that I could go on a good run. And... um And, you know, that we would get back together on Valentine's Day of 2000. This was the plan. And so I proceeded to go on a really good run. And on February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day, I'm walking into my dorm room at 8 a.m. And he's walking in from the other directions with roses and donuts because he wanted to surprise me. And why would it be a surprise if he showed up when he said he was going to? And I don't know what you look like when you're coming home at 8 o'clock in the morning, but I looked like what you think I would look like. And I saw that Al-Anon look again, you know, that um, just disgust, terror, and unconditional love. 
and it unmanned me. It just pulled my covers entirely. And it was the, what do they call it? The moment of clarity where I was able to look down and have this rush of information process in my brain where I saw how I had been trying to stop and couldn't about how, you know, I heard it said in a meeting when I was pretty new, I just, I just lost my hustle. I lost my hustle. I couldn't pretend like I was okay for one second. By the way, I thought I looked so smoking hot. I was, um, like 60 pounds lighter than I am now. And I was really enjoying that. But when I looked down in that moment, I realized that I was completely emaciated and I had open sores all over my body and I was using Sharpie for eyeliner. <laughs> look good. And like all of this data points like came together and like fired and it was like, I'm not okay. I am not okay. And um, I told him, I was like, I'm going to, Bri, I'm going to go to rehab. I'm going to go to rehab. And so I called this psychiatrist that I had been seeing at the time. And I told him everything that was going on. And he's like, well, you're an addict and an alcoholic and you need to, well, first of all, you need to go check, get checked out at the hospital because I was having chest pain. And then we're going to get you in rehab. And um, my parents were at like a family function in Ohio, of course. And I needed to call them and let them know to like get them enlisted in this process. And again, because I'm not courageous or forthright, I called my mother's twin and told her so that she could call my parents. And I'm sitting in the dorm room just waiting. And um, and the phone rings, and I know it's my mother. And <sighs> and I was so ready for her to just rip me a new one. You know what I mean? Like, I, I was expecting to pick up the phone and have her just tear into me. And what happened <laughs> was I picked up the phone, and my mother and my father were on the phone, and they were crying. And they said, we love you. We're so sorry you've been going through this. We're flying out right away, and we'll do anything we can to help you. And it just further pulled my cover. It's like I just, I wasn't expecting, I wasn't expecting that. And so I, um, the boyfriend came back, and he drove me to the emergency room. And when the doctors would leave the room, I would do lines off the heart monitor. Because I had some left, right? You don't go to rehab with some left. And, <laughs> and uh and so I was a little chatty, and when they asked me, <laughs> they were asking me questions like, well, do you, do you ever think about killing yourself? And it's like, well, of course I think about killing myself. I'd love to die. You know, I've always just fantasized about doing it, but I've never had the balls to just pull the trigger. And like, they were like, psych ward. And it was my first time going to an adult psych ward, and it wasn't until I was in the ambulance that it hit me, and I had that, like, alcoholic, like, I think I've overreacted <laughs> you know, like, thing, and, um, and they took me in, and they did the intake, and it was brutal. There was, like, a strip search, and I, I felt very violated, and, and then they put me in the gown with the open back, and I was teeny tiny. I was shredded to pieces, and um, they walked me through the, like, open area, whatever that is called, of the psych ward. And there were, like, actual crazy people there. And right as they're about to take me into the observation room, I heard my future roommate snoring loudly. And it just set me off. I freaked out. And I started fighting. I started trying to run. And it was like a scene out of a movie. You know, there were four orderlies. I'm kicking and screaming and fighting and biting. And, um, and they threw me in the room. And they wouldn't give me any tissue. Don't know what that was about. So I'm using the sheet as tissues. My tongue split open in about four places. You know, I'm just, like, super dehydrated, just, like, crying snotty tears. Bryce loves it when I say snotsicles. And, um, you know, just freaking out. And then what happened was I slept it off. I ended up going to sleep for, like, the first time in God knows how long. And I woke up, and it... The ego has amazing recuperative powers. And I woke up in the morning, and I got to have a phone call, so I called the boyfriend, and I was like, baby, I love you. <laughs> Here's where my car keys are. This is the plan. You're going to drive through the wall. <laughs> and we're going to go down to Mexico, and I'm going to marry you, and I'm going to have your babies. And he's like, yeah, so Al, I think this might be a good idea, and like maybe you should stay. And it was like, oh, crap. And I don't know what happened, but it was kind of magical. And I was telling the nurses, like, 
um, you know, oh, I don't, I don't belong here. I know my rights. And they're looking at me. They're like, you, you really truly look like you belong here. <laughs> and, um, and they introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was 19 years old and I had no idea why they were talking to me about alcohol and alcoholism. I, I couldn't understand at all why they thought I was an alcoholic. I clearly had a nose candy problem and, you know, we can address that, but I can count the number of times that I drank. And they're like, yeah, you know, is it worth it for you to maybe not drink for a year um, if you never have to feel the way you're feeling right now again? And it's like, well, okay, you know the answer to that. Of course it's worth it, right? And they're like, all right, well, we'll refund your misery in full if after a year. And so then I was like, all right, but like, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual program. So we can do acid, right? And they were like, they were like, yes, just wait a year. Oh, they tricked me. And, um, and they started taking me to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it wasn't until I was out of like the psych ward portion and they moved me into detox that I walked into my first meeting and it was in a little room with a bunch of weird people and the like steps were on the wall. And I had never, like, I, I don't know how I had heard about Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was like, oh, this is real. And like, they're like, hi, Bob. And I'm like, oh, this is really bad. Um, but what also simultaneously happened to me is I listened to them and I was like, all right, I'm in. I got no other plan. And I was beaten and I was desperate. And so if you're new here, I hope you're desperate. I hope you have the gift of desperation. And I don't know about you, but I am a phenomenal starter. I can't finish anything, but I am a phenomenal (laughs) starter. So I decided, you know, I was put in a 28-day rehab program, and um, I decided that I was going to be the best little... It's it's a bug, you guys, seriously. Anyway, I decided that I was going to be the best damn AA you've ever seen. I was going to work the steps faster than anybody's ever worked the steps. I was going to join an Alano club. I was going to have a sponsor, and I was going to, like, get commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was going to be somebody. And uh, and I chose um, this woman to sponsor me, and I started kind of, like, trying to do this thing. But then I got out of rehab, and it was like, oh, my God, I haven't seen my boyfriend in, like, 30 days, people. I have to go spend time with him. And, I, you know, I pulled out of a semester at school. I got to get re-enrolled in school and, like, get started with that right away. Like, I've been missing out on life. I got to get going. And what happened to me is 90 days passed, and I had been to, like, 30 meetings. And I hit bottom in sobriety as truly as I had that day that I went into the psych ward. I was doing everything I was doing drunk, sober, and feeling the full repercussions of my behavior. It's like I was still shoplifting. I was cheating on my boyfriend in the parking lot of La Jolla Speakers with my rehab romance. (laughs) And I was doing something else, and I can't remember what it was, but at the time it felt very impactful. And I hit bottom, but I promise you I had heard enough In that period of time, in the 28 days of rehab and the little bit thereafter where I still had some hustle, that I believed that you guys had the answer. And I don't know why that happened, because as much as I've been honest with everyone my whole life, you know, other than, like, my parents and, like, the people around me, you know, like, doctors and stuff, no, I've never once believed you understood until I got to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and when I talked about, like, you, you talked about, like, the hole in the soul that the wind whipped through. You talked about fearing like you were the least of God's creatures, you know, and that you had to either be on the top of the heap or the bottom of the pile. And I just was like, yeah, you get it. And I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. And so I knew that I hadn't done what you said you did around here, and I wanted to give it a try. So everyone, when I started saying, like, I need a sponsor that's going to kick my ass, pointed to the same woman. And I asked her to sponsor me. And she said, all right, you know, are you willing to do anything I ask as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or indecent? And I was like, you're so serious. (laughs) Yes. And she's like, okay, you need to go to seven meetings a week. You need to have... Commitments at four Alcoholics Anonymous meetings a week. You need to be at my house every Sunday at 9 a.m., which was an inappropriate hour 
at that time, and um, to read out of the book and do t- written 10 steps with your sobriety sisters. And she just rolled out this laundry list of things that she expected me to do if she was going to sponsor me. And I was like, yes, I will do it. And I started right away with her. And when she gave me my year token, she told me that she didn't think I was going to make it a week. And, you know, I don't know what happened, but um, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started learning about alcoholism. And I started understanding how I suffered from the disease of alcoholism. And in the beginning, I had to, like, you know, trade words and do this, he for she, drugs for alcohol, all this stuff. And, like, over time, it all went away. And like the truth of my alcoholism and that internal spirituality and what happens when I take the first drink and, and you know, the things that it sets in motion, I, I understood that to be my truth. And I'm so grateful that I did. I, um, I start, I worked the steps with her and it took me a long time. I think I had, I was still on my fourth step when I got it, you know, turned a year sober. I was not like a quick study by any means. I did get really involved in service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm, whatever you are, there's a place for you in AA. And I'm a nerd, like hardcore nerd. So I fell in love with the business committee meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I like joined the central office business committee and like was stoked that they presented the financials to me and the board, you know, like I know it's sad, but that's my truth. And I was, you know, I loved doing the phones. I was laughing, you know, it's like my, um, my first date with my ex-husband was answering phones at AA central. If anyone remembers the black couch, it's seen some shit. And, um, so by the way, if God will, I believe God works with your bad motives. So if you have a crush that's signed up, by all means, be of service. And, um, you know, I did everything in Alcoholics Anonymous and, um, and my life got so good. I was like one of those pink cloud jerks. Everything was amazing. You know, I graduated college. I bought a home. I had a job. You know, I passed the CPA exam, like all this like stuff, you know, just, and then I got married and that's when I went downhill, but it was really good. And I started, the reason it it wasn't the marriage, I mean, other than, you know, the marriage, but I, um, I started losing babies. I was trying to get pregnant and I was having a hard time getting pregnant and then I would get pregnant and I would lose, I would lose the babies. And it was the first time in Alcoholics Anonymous that I couldn't work the steps and be okay. Up until that point, I had always just been able to work a 10 step, say the resentment prayer, do the good little AA. And like it was fixed. Every one of my problems was fixed, but grief. Grief was so powerful, and I lost my footing entirely. I'm so accustomed to being able to, like, have a spiritual program and take my spiritual temperature, and I couldn't. I lost my barometer entirely between hormones, which is, like, a legit thing, and um, and and the actual just loss. And I had to, and it was, like, it was my growing up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you, I, and I don't know why I feel like it's my message, but I don't know that it's shared enough, you know, in the rooms. Like when, you know, I got sober at 19. I'm, how old am I? 37. Like I'm 18 years sober. I've lived a lot of life and, um, I've gone through a divorce and, and, you know, I went on to, um, be very impregnated. I have three children. I have um, nine-year-old twins, and and you know my son went through an autism diagnosis, and um, and I didn't sleep for five years, and I wasn't really able to hit meetings, and um, and you know, and I was able to do that because I had a sponsor and women around me because I had put in the legwork and built up a foundation in Alcoholics Anonymous that I was able to show up and keep my feet moving in spite of the fact that I promise you my feelings did not follow. And I was not okay for a very long time. And now it's been so good again. For so long, I came through a period of just true kind of hardship with just like life events. And, um, and I've gotten back into this stream of life and I've gotten back into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, working with others is absolutely spectacular. If you don't necessarily have the ability or will to do that, I recommend dating a newcomer. I'm kidding. <laughs> 
I'm kidding, but I, I am dating a newcomer. And um, it's been fun because I get to so many more meetings. <laughs> it was not intentional, I promise you, and I don't truly recommend that. Because, by the way, the reason that I think I think that they say don't date newcomers is not for the newcomer. They'll be fine. They're like, you, you, you can't, they're like kids. You can drop them. They're fine. <laughs> like, it's the old timer. They'll make you crazy. You know, you have to be really spiritually fit. <laughs> anyway, but um, no, I don't really think you should date a newcomer. But it has been a really nice thing in my life lately um, because I've been because I've been getting to a lot more meetings and God works with my bad motives sometimes. I um, I ended up changing sponsors a couple of times in sobriety too. At the um, tail end of my marriage, and my life was completely falling apart. Like um, my sponsor fired me, and um, and I had to find another sponsor with like. I don't know. I had over 10 years at the time. And, um, and it's really hard to find and build a relationship with a sponsor from scratch when you're 10 years sober. And like women have a tendency to drop out of the program too. Like there's not a like ton of women with time. You get involved in family and they hit women's meetings only and you never see them again. And so, um, I found a woman, um, to sponsor me and she's just as irreverent as I am and spiritual and fit at the same time. And, and she sponsored me lovingly for seven years. And then I finally made my way back to my heart sponsor, my first sponsor that, you know, I worked the steps with and we've been together and, and I'm working the steps again and, and I'm sponsoring women and I'm showing up to meetings and, and I have to tell you, I absolutely love Alcoholics Anonymous. I spent every day from the time I was 11 till 19 either wishing I had never been born or, like, actively trying to, like, commit suicide. And I haven't felt like that since I had 90 days of sobriety. And I'm not saying that, like, you know, I had been diagnosed with, like, clinical depression and all this stuff. And for me, it was a misdiagnosis. I was just suffering from untreated alcoholism. And it is absolutely spectacular how much at work it takes to keep me same. You know, it's, it's really unfair, really, <laughs> how much work it takes to keep me stable and sane. But um, I'm so willing to do it because it's so cool. It's so cool to be around here and have a fellowship grow up amongst me. I have the most amazing women in my lives and I have just in my life and I don't have multiple personalities in my life and <laughs> and to just have these relationships with these women and my children are growing up with like a bunch of like aunties and uncles like that they can go to because you know I don't know how that's going to go but if they need to talk to somebody like the people of Alcoholics Anonymous are around them and I'm really grateful for that so I was told a good speaker ends on time and a great speaker ends five minutes early so thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.